Hello and a very warm welcome to the 54th annual meeting of the Asian Development Bank's Board of Governors. I'm Zainab Badawi, your host for this opening event, a conversation with the ADB president, Masatsugu Asakawa, or as he prefers to be known, President Masa for short. And this is the second year that the meeting over the next three days of the ADB Board of Governors is being held in a virtual format because of the impact of COVID-19. No one in any corner of the world has been left untouched by what we now know is the most devastating pandemic in a century. Many of us sadly have seen family, friends and colleagues affected by the virus and the threat to livelihoods is absolutely widespread. But as countries battle with both the health challenges and the economic fallout, there is a great deal of hope that modern science and the vaccines coming on stream will provide us with a way out. So we can approach this annual meeting with a degree of optimism. And throughout the last year, ADB has been playing a critical role across Asia and the Pacific, supporting the most vulnerable populations and helping its developing member countries forge a path forward to recovery. Well, over the next three days, you're going to hear much more about these efforts in sessions exploring various aspects of the bank's plans to promote a green, resilient and more inclusive recovery. And spearheading ADB's efforts in response to COVID-19 is, of course, President Massa. President Massa, wonderful to be with you in this uh, conversation. Terrific. Hello from London to you in uh, Manila. Now, you know what? When you became president of the Asian Development Bank in January 2020, I bet you had no idea what was going to happen. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us very soon after. So what have the past 18 months been like for you? Okay, uh, Zenav, good to see you again. I clearly remember that uh, we had a very nice chat at uh, the last year's annual meetings, virtual annual meeting in September. Uh, so at that time, I was, uh, you know, honestly uh, hoping uh, that this year we could have a face-to-face -face annual meeting in Georgia in May. But even after one year, uh, still uh, this uh, pandemic is uh, raising and people are really suffering uh, from huge impact uh, caused by this uh, pandemic. Uh, for myself, I left uh, my uh, family uh, back in Tokyo. So in Manila, I am uh, you know, uh, living uh, there alone, uh, but uh, totally occupied uh, with operational issues with ADB to cope with uh, COVID-19, but also uh, in the context of uh, our regional term strategy 2030. Like everybody else in the world in the past year, your staff have been working from home, but you chose to go into the office at your headquarters in Manila every day wearing a smart suit like the one you're wearing right now. <laughs> How has that been for the bank operationally, everybody working from home in, in their own mm. countries? Yeah, Zainab, actually uh, we had to shut down our headquarters as early as uh, mid-March uh, last year. And almost at the same time, the whole area of Metro Manila uh, got locked down. And even as of today, after one year, uh, we see almost uh, nobody uh, working in this uh, uh, building. Uh, so most uh, ADB staff are working from home. Nonetheless, I'd like to uh, say that uh, uh, if you look at our performance uh, last year, for example, if you look at our uh, lending uh, our volume, our commitment amount, our, our delivery amount, and also our borrowing program uh, from the capital markets, every figures are record high in our history. Uh, so while I am really grateful uh, for both uh, the modern technology and uh, the staff uh, who were working on the clock, this year I decided to put uh, the highest priority on uh, well-being of staff. Just give us a brief overview of what kind of effects um, that the pandemic has had on the people of the region because it started off as a health crisis and then mm. it quickly became an economic and social mm. and even perhaps political crisis. Uh, quite uh, regrettably, uh, I have to say that uh, income 
inequality situation uh, and also uh, absolute poverty situation uh, will surely get worsened. And that need to be urgently addressed you know, uh, by uh, everybody. Uh, so right now, every uh, uh, our DMC uh, governments, uh, developing member country governments, are trying to address this you know, poverty uh, issues urgently uh, by enhancing uh, their social protection programs uh, included in their uh, counter-cyclical uh, fiscal uh, uh, spending uh, policies. And that's good. That's very much needed uh, from the uh, very uh, urgent point of view. But from a little bit more in you know, a longer term uh, perspective, if uh, we'd like to uh, make our recovery more inclusive and sustainable, I think what is needed uh, is to have uh, those poor people, vulnerable, peop vulnerable people, participate in the uh, recovery process, participate in the uh, growth process, participate in the development process by securing high quality job for them. And uh, from our point of view as international financial institution, what is really needed uh, to that end is to you know, uh, invest more and more in human beings. And more concretely, uh, more investment in education sector and health sector. Those are sectors you know, are very, very significant uh, to ensure uh, that our you know, growth uh, pattern is uh, more inclusive and sustainable. Uh, so even before this pandemic uh, crisis uh, took uh, place, uh, of course, ADB has, uh, did provide uh, our you know, uh, resources, assistance in those uh, uh, areas. Uh, but from now on, I'd like to see a bit more you know, expansion of our operation in those areas. I, I want to just um, remind you of the fact that on the 6th of April, um, at the height of the you know, pandemic, when we could see what was going on, you decided to go to a food bank distribution centre <laughs> in um, a rundown part of Manila, and you were actually active in handing out some of the food parcels to the people there. Yeah, uh, Zainab, I was delighted uh, to uh, join that initiative actually, and I went to one of the relatively poor uh, region uh, of Metro Manila uh, with uh, rice and canned food. And uh, initially, I thought that people's you know, face uh, who were really suffering uh, fr from this pandemic and economic crisis you know, caused by this pandemic. But later, I saw also a big smile of people and also express expression of gratitude uh, for us. Uh, those you know, faces are really you know, uh, is inspired uh, my uh, hard work uh, throughout last year and even now. But it's also had um Effects such as, for example, we know that women have suffered much mm. more in the pandemic. They're more likely to lose their jobs. And sadly, some of them obviously having to stay at home are enduring degrees of domestic violence, um, mm. you know, that on, on a great scale right across the world. I mean, that must be something of great concern to you. Oh, yes, very much. Uh, thank you very much for pointing out this very important issue, uh, Zainab san well, unfortunately, uh, still the women and girls are uh, you know, among the most severely affected group uh, by this pandemic. Uh, so once again, I noticed that you know, every uh, developing country's uh, governments uh, are trying to address these issues by, for example, including appropriate uh, policy measures such as unconditional cash transfer or, uh, and or uh, food subsidies uh, to women, women and girls uh, in uh, vulnerable uh, households. And we are really supporting uh, uh, that kind of you know, policy orientation uh, to address this issue. But at the same time, uh, one thing we should not forget is that uh, the fact uh, that as a, one of the devastating consequences of this pandemic uh, is the increased number of domestic violence, as you rightly mentioned. And domestic violence uh, has been triggered by this uh, pandemic, but even worsened uh, by the prolonged uh, lockdown measures, which have forced uh, the victims to, to stay with uh, abusers uh, with uh, little uh, access to health. So this uh, is also uh, you know, a kind of urgent uh, issues uh, we uh, need to address. And uh, ADB has been uh, discussing with the uh, DMC government uh, to secure necessary you know, resources for uh, this kind of uh, gender-based violence support program. So that's one example of what the bank has been doing um, because you're seen very much as being at the forefront 
of um, the response to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So just give us a couple more examples of the kind of mm. assistance you've been providing. Well, you know, right after this pandemic uh, broke out, uh, you know, January, February last year, the first request uh, we did receive uh, from our DMC was uh, the grant money uh, from ADB for them to procure, you know, very critical medical supplies, uh, such as masks, uh, ventilators, uh, testing kits, and uh, PPEs, and so on. Uh, so we provided the, the necessary uh, assistance in the form of technical assistance uh, to many, many DMCs. Then, I would say after March, April uh, last year, uh, we uh, started to receive another type of request from our DMC uh, government, which is uh, for us to provide loans uh, to uh, finance their uh, fiscal expenditure. Uh, so in order to respond to uh, that kind of request, uh, ADB introduced a totally new financing instrument called CIPRO, C -P -R -O, which stands for COVID-19 Pandemic Response Option, uh, which is a quick dispersing you know, uh, uh, budget uh, financing uh, instrument. And uh, including the CIPRO as uh, our main elements, we announced, uh, that was last April, uh, 20 billion US dollars, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 assistance package. And by the end of uh, last year, uh, December last year, we already committed almost 17 billion dollars out of this 20 billion package uh, in the form of grant, technical assistance, and loans uh, to our DMC governments and also to private sectors. So that's just, you know, uh, what we, we, we did last year. But I, I must ask you, uh, um, one particular aspect of ADB's mm. um, response is look, this issue of vaccines. What is the bank doing specifically to try to ensure that everybody everywhere can get access to vaccines? Because that's kind of seen as the way of getting out of this uh, right. terrible crisis. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So vaccines are really, you know, hope. Uh, for everybody. And uh, actually, uh, uh, every DMC uh, governments are now preparing vaccination uh, their, 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 their people. So uh, quite recently, uh, what is needed uh, is additional financing uh, for them to procure safe and effective vaccine, as well as plan and also knowledge to ensure equitable and effective distribution, vaccine distribution, you know, systems in each DMCs. Uh, so after we heard that kind of request, uh, we once again uh, launched another a new type of financing scheme called APVAX, Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility, with a total amount of $9 billion uh, in uh, December last year. And this APBAX, uh, uh, new financial, uh, financing instrument, APBAX, uh, takes care of uh, two things. One is, as I mentioned, it would uh, provide the uh, necessary financing for our DMCs to uh, procure the uh, you know, uh, necessary amount of uh, vaccines together with other, other IFIs. But also, it also takes care of uh, necessary investment uh, for them to introduce as an appropriate uh, vaccine distribution uh, scheme, uh, yeah, including you know, super cold chain and so on. And uh, in March last uh, month, we already approved uh, you know, uh, two uh, financing uh, under this uh, APBAX, one for Philippines, uh, one for Indonesia. And right now, we are working on many other countries who have topped uh, this financing. But you know, there are a lot of people who are saying, look, of course the world is rightly focused on the vaccine rollout program and responding to the emergency needs of COVID-19. But look, they're saying, don't forget the big challenges that humankind faces. And of course, here I'm talking mm. about climate change. And as mm. though we needed any reminding about the importance of doing something about that, we saw the recent uh, cyclone and floods in Indonesia and Timor-Leste, East Timor, and dozens of people losing their lives. Mm. Tell me, in terms of climate change, what is the bank continuing to do, both in mitigation and mm. adaptation? Well, actually, this region, Asia Pacific region, uh, is uh, accountable for almost 50% of uh, CO2 uh, gas emission. And if uh, you look at the first three quarters of last year, we saw uh, some reduction of CO2 emission. 
uh, I would say, 7 to 8 percent compared with uh, 2019. But already in the fourth quarter of last year, we saw the rebound of CO2 emission uh, as uh, the global economy started to recover. So that needs to be properly controlled, and we should definitely aim at achieving a green recovery. And needless to say, uh, this is the year of COP26. So ADB, together with other MDBs, has committed uh, to align our operation with Paris Agreement uh, through a couple of measures. First, by allowing each of our operations uh, to either mitigation or adaptation uh, or target of Paris Agreement. And second, by ramping up our climate financing. And thirdly, uh, by enhancing our capacity building efforts in DMCs uh, in this context. Under the, our strategy 2030, uh, we have introduced two concrete numerical targets. The first target says by 2030, uh, at least 75% of our total operation in number uh, should address adaptation and or mitigation. And second numerical target uh, says uh, that between the year 2019 and 2030, for those 12 years, we should aim at providing our uh, climate financing with the amount of $80 billion cumulatively. Uh, secondly, uh, talking of our you know, endeavor uh, to enhance our cap uh, capacity building uh, activities in our DMCs. Another thing we uh, try to do is to uh, provide necessary advice and resources uh, to let the DMC economy less and less dependent on fossil fuels by uh, setting standards and, uh, and regulations, and also by introducing uh, low carbon and climate resilient technology, such as uh, renewable energy with storage, a smart grid, and such as uh, carbon capture. And a very important aspect to all this is, of course, domestic resource mobilisation mm. is such a critical fact and mm. also international tax cooperation. Mm. Now, I know from your past career that you're something of a tax expert, both domestically in Japan <laughs> and also, you know, international. So this is your real kind of forte. Um, so just explain to me why you think domestic resource mobilisation and international tax cooperation are such a big cause that you are championing at the ADP. Yeah, thank you, Zainab. This is one of my most favorite you know, topics. Uh, <laughs> uh, right now, uh, you know, uh, obviously uh, our DMC, not only DMC, but every developing countries are under enormous pressure on budget and public debt, uh, uh, resulting uh, from a large scale uh, counter-cyclical fiscal expenditures. You know, I'm not saying uh, that's a not needed, that's a bad thing, but resulting accumulation of public debt, especially if the debt is denominated in US dollars, uh, would be my, of my concern uh, from uh, uh, two perspectives. One perspective is if we look back at our history, whenever uh, any developed countries, especially the US, are the country of uh, key currency, start to hike uh, its interest, interest rate. Uh, in the uh, context of uh, monetary policy normalization, then quite often we saw huge, huge you know, uh, impact uh, put on the capital markets of both developing and emerging countries. Uh, those are the uh, you know, kind of uh, pressures, uh, first of all, for uh, the interest hike in those countries, and then pressures for capital outflow, and then pressures on depreciation of their currencies. Second thing, it may be a good idea for any developing countries to uh, try to rely on uh, more and more domestic resources by reducing their dependency on external financing. And domestic resource means taxation, tax revenue. So if you look at the tax to GDP uh, ratio, uh, it's not really encouraging here in, in our region. The, re the figure is relatively low compared with the other part of the world. But which means, uh, in other words, uh, there is a uh, much, much room uh, for them uh, to increase tax revenue by uh, restructuring their tax policy or uh, enhancing tax uh, administration uh, capacity. I am of a view that uh, you know, uh, this region of Asia-Pacific would uh, continuously attract uh, foreign investment. 
uh, in the form of uh, you know, uh, investment by uh, multinationals. That's fine, they are welcome to come here. Uh, but if you are coming here, uh, multinationals are coming here and conduct economic activities and make profit, then they should pay a fair amount of tax. So this kind of inter international tax cooperation initiative is very much relevant and beneficial for Asia and Pacific region. So we decided, ADB decided to launch so-called uh, regional tax hub uh, to promote both DRM and ITC, uh, domestic resource mobilization initiative and international tax cooperation initiative uh, to promote tax policy dialogue, to promote uh, information sharing exercise and to promote uh, capacity building initiatives uh, to that end. Uh, so I hope as many DMCs would participate in this hub uh, in that context. Right. And another key foundation stone of the Asian Development Bank throughout its history has been regional cooperation and mm. integration. And um, I know that you are a very accomplished flute player and, um, <laughs> you know, you're used to playing in an orchestra where everybody's got to be, you know, coordinated and so on. So, but here you are as president of the Asian Development Bank, having to be the conductor. How confident are you that you can enhance regional cooperation and integration um, in order to make sure that the Asia Pacific region recovers from the COVID-19 yes. pandemic? This is a very important subject and uh, regional cooperation is really ADB's uh, DNA. Uh, it's clearly prescribed uh, in our charter. And uh, you know, I can think of a couple of you know, areas uh, where we can enhance our regional cooperation effort. For example, first, we could uh, try to diversify our regional uh, supply chains to complement global supply chains uh, to make whole system more robust and resilient. And secondly, uh, we should really en enhance our regional health security under the current pandemic and even the, uh, under the future uh, pandemic. For example, uh, surveillance exercise, monitoring, reporting, those exercises can be done jointly uh, by the neighboring countries in the same region. And vaccination uh, can be also uh, conducted jointly, uh, uh, well, mainly because of its uh, nature of uh, public uh, goods. And thirdly, uh, we can uh, consider to uh, strengthen our regional financial safety net. Well, look, finally now, um, you've outlined a great deal of the programme that um, the ADB has been carrying out in response to the um, pandemic. But, you know, when you're just looking at Asia as a whole, you've got this young, vibrant, technologically, mm. digitally savvy population. And there are many commentators who say the 21st century is the Asian century. So um, how far do you think the pandemic perhaps has rocked Asia? Has it really pushed it off this course of being the kind of economic powerhouse of the world? Mm. Yes, uh, I firmly believe uh, that this uh, region of Asia Pacific uh, will continuously uh, to be an engine uh, for the uh, global growth, economic growth, uh, by overcoming uh, many, many challenges uh, we are now uh, facing. Uh, let me reiterate a couple of things. One is uh, this uh, you know, pandemic has really increased the fiscal vulnerability of our uh, developing member countries. So DRM uh, initiative is very, very uh, crucial in this context. And secondly, uh, digitalization. Once again, uh, this uh, COVID-19 has accelerated uh, the transition of our economy to digitalization. And uh, ADB also tried to integrate uh, the modern technologies uh, to our operation as much as possible. But here, we have to be careful uh, with uh, one thing. Uh, in order to uh, make our recovery and development paths are more sustainable and inclusive, we need to reduce digital divide. 50% of global, global population has no access to broad, broadband connections. So internet connections need to be improved dramatically, and also the cost of connection need to be reduced, and usability of the connection need to be improved. And finally, globalization once again. Uh, I'm uh, quite sure globalization will come back and we need to enhance our global cooperation uh, to fight against this uh, uh, COVID-19, which is also of such a global nature. And I do believe that the enhanced uh, regional cooperation in this region uh, would uh, surely contribute uh, to the rapid and robust uh, recovery of world economy. And ADB is more than happy 
to support that. Well, you heard it here. The death of globalization is greatly exaggerated. You say it's still <laughs> with us. So, President Massa, thank you so much. I know when you first started your studies at Tokyo University and then at Princeton in the United States, you had thought at one point you might become a journalist, but then you went into <laughs> economics and finance. I'm glad you didn't become a journalist because I, the journalists, have really enjoyed tremendously putting these questions to you and listening to your <laughs> answers. Thank you so much indeed. And thank you from all of us to President Massa for being with us in this conversation, a curtain raiser that kicks off the 54th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank. To all our annual meeting participants, welcome again to the annual meeting. But for now, from me, Zain Abadawi in London, it's goodbye. And it's uh, goodbye from you two in Manila, President Massa, isn't it? Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye now.